And say, I said I could start it too. So if you want to go ahead. We're late. Oh. We better go. We got it. We got it. We got it. <laughs> it's okay. I know, right? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome. Sorry, we had a couple technical issues, but we are here now. Where is everybody joining us from tonight? Go ahead and drop that in chat. Maryland, welcome back, Mark. Oh, Tampa, welcome. Oh, we've got Ann Arbor, Michigan in the house as well. Where else is everybody from? I am going to butcher that name. Oconomowoc. Oconomowoc. Thank you. <laughs> Denver's in the I house. Live near well. Oconomowoc. Oh, so I'm Cal. from Oconomowoc too, Kathy or Catherine. <laughs> Welcome from so. But now I live in Colorado. <laughs> Wonderful. We'll give it just another minute, letting people log in, and then we will get started. Thanks again for your patience, guys. We did run into a few little technical glitches. Okay, so um, I am having. I'm still having issues with my screen. So the tech gods are not cooperating fully tonight. Um, Candace, would you like to go ahead and give the introduction? Sure, we normally have a um, slide presentation, but tonight we are uniquely live here in uh, Giuseppe's International Oil and Vinegars. And this is Joe, he is the owner of Giuseppe's. Joe, introduce yourself and tell us how long you've been in business. Sounds good. Uh, well, thank you for joining uh, tonight in my shop. Uh, so uh, I'm Joe Cuscello, owner of uh, Giuseppe's International Oils and Vinegars. We've been at this location at uh, Partridge Creek Mall in Clinton Township, Michigan for going on 10 years now. And it's a, just a great, fun tasting room to come in, taste good oils and vinegars, have a good time, and uh, really enjoy sharing good quality oils and vinegars with people. And for those of you who don't know us or are joining us for the very first time, I'm Candice Stearns owner of State Islands Travel. Uh, we put together a virtual vacation back in April of 2000 when the pandemic started. And those of us in the travel business um, just wouldn't let travel die. We wanted to keep the dreams alive. And even though we couldn't physically go to some of our favorite places in Europe, uh, we decided to start hosting weekly uh, virtual vacations. And some of you have been with us for a very long time. And some of you have only been with us for a short time. But out of that spawned um, some actual meetup groups. And some of you might be joining us through a meetup group. So we have a meetup, uh, Eat, Drink, Travel Detroit. Uh, where we have hopefully going to be uh, hosting some in-person uh, actual meetups here pretty soon, as soon as the governor lets us meet with more than five or six people at a time. Uh, but we also have Maria on the call. Maria, introduce yourself and tell us about your meetup group. I have Eat, Drink, Travel, Greater Tampa Bay. So for those of you who are in the meetup group locally, we do have one that we are currently planning. So be sure to be on the lookout for March 24th. As soon as I get those details finalized, I will share that with all of you. Welcome, everybody. And then we have Angela on the call. Angela Ershawood, would you introduce yourself, please? Hi, yes, I'm Angela Isherwood. I'm from Wisconsin, so I run the Lake Country Meetup, and I'm excited to uh, taste all these oils that Joe put together in such a wonderful package. So thank you so much for that, Joe. And then we'll also now kick it over to Heidi Feast from our Colorado chapter. Originally from Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. I know how to spell it and pronounce it correctly from the time I was a small child. Yes, I do. <laughs> Um, I have been Veneto Travel Design Firm, and I also manage the meetup group for the Colorado Rockies, and we are hoping to have a couple events up here in Steamboat Springs, again, as soon as COVID restrictions allow, and then some down in the Denver area as well, and maybe some other parts of Colorado as we get going. All right, so we'll kick it back over to you, Maria, and you can introduce our lovely uh, 
uh, guest speaker who's going to talk about Greece and Italy and all things oil and vinegar. Welcome. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us tonight. I'm going to uh, put all of our information too for where you can find us in the chat. And before we end tonight, I'll let you know how you can save it so that you can keep our contact information so you can reach out with questions about these itineraries or even anything else that's going on right now in the world of travel because it is an ever changing landscape and it can be hard to try and keep on top of everything. So tonight, our guest is Christina Papamosopoulos who is a good friend of mine here in the Tampa Bay area. She designed our trip to take us part of Greece and Italy to let us experience the olive oil and how, and where you can find and participate in the olive oil experience, I should say. You can find it really all over the countries, both of those countries, but the area she's gonna to highlight tonight really speak to the olive oil and all things good food. Christina, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. All right. Oh, and here, I had told Candace she needed to say this, and I didn't even say it. Kalos <laughs> Irthese, welcome in Greek to all of you for joining us tonight. I apologize, we really got a little thrown off with these tech issues. Thanks for bearing with us. <laughs> yes, and in Greek we say, we say Kalispera, good evening. And for my Italian friends, you can maybe correct me, is it Buonosera, is that correct? Yeah, good evening. Yes, yes. Joe, what do you say, thumbs up? <laughs> <laughs> All right, can we, can you guys see my screen? We good? Yes, we can see it. Awesome, All right. Well, let's begin. So a little bit about um, what we'll cover this evening. Um, so welcome to the Mediterranean. We're gonna share some fun facts on each of the countries. We're gonna be looking at um, Greece and Italy this evening and the top places where olive oil is produced in both. Um, we'll look at one particular unique mill which has award-winning medical research uh, based on the caliber of its olive oil. We'll introduce you to the tiny Italian town that gave us balsamic oil, Maserati and Ferrari. And we'll also travel along on a custom 10 day culinary inspired itinerary, uh, going beyond just olive oil to enjoy both countries. So just a little bit about me. Again, uh, Maria introduced me, Christina Papavlasopoulos. That's a great Greek name, right? <laughs> um, I am co-founder of Myths and Muses and Shafari. So Myths and Muses is our boutique destination company specializing in Greece and the Southern uh, Europe region with various unique experiences. And Shafari is the first of its kind marketplace connecting women through join in group adventures and retreats. Um, so feel free to ask your travel advisors about our exclusive itineraries and special perks and pricing on either of our companies. So we'll begin with Greece, welcome. We have uh, 10.72 million people living in Greece currently, roughly. Um, there are over, there are 6,000 islands total, but uh, 227 are inhabited. The currency is Euro. Originally it was the Greek drachma and it became part of the EU in 01. And there are seven main island groups, the Ionian, the Cycladic Islands, Dodecanese, Saronic, the Northern Sporades, the Aegean and Crete is its own. And uh, for those of you, if you're interested more on some of the basics on Greece, um, some you know kind of hidden gem places to go, uh, Maria can probably pull that up for you guys at some point or put a link in the virtual vacation group. Um, there, we did a, a Greece one in the past with some basics. So we're gonna kind of focus on this itinerary tonight. Here are the island groups. Um, we have, you know, I like to show it because a lot of people try to say, oh, let's do Corfu and then Santorini and then Scathos. And as you can see, it's all over the map. So it's really important to travel kind of, you know, locally within the group. So the Ionians are off to the west, the Saronic, Cycladic, the Cycladic ones are probably the most common that you've heard of, Mykonos, Santorini and that sort of thing. So it's nice to kind of see them all on the map. And then switching gears to Italy, uh, much more populated, 60.3 million people living in Italy today with 20 regions. Also, the currency is Euro, uh, used to be the Italian Lira. They became part of the EU in 99 
And we'll mainly focus on the regions of Emilia-Romagna, where uh, Modena is, Campania with the Amalfi Coast, and Toscana or Tuscany. And we're going to focus on Siena and Montalcino. And here you can see the various regions. We have Emilia Romano, where we'll talk about Tuscany, and then down here, Campania is where the Amalfi Coast is. And a lot of people just kind of like to see it all in relation on the, the map. Here's Italy in comparison to kind of the Adriatic coast and Greece here. And actually uh, over here to the west is where Corfu is and the Ionian Islands. And you have a beautiful view to Albania from different parts of Corfu from there. So we'll begin with a little video on Greece. begin with the Peloponnese Peninsula. Uh, this region accounts for 35% of the olive oil production. So a lot of you may know, of course, Kalamata olives, where a majority of that comes from. You probably know the village of Sparta um, and many other ancient villages in that area. And the Peloponnese is really beautiful. It's known for its, you know, authentic B&Bs to luxury five-star resorts. This is one of the most beautiful luxury properties um, in the Peloponnese. This is the Aman Zoe from the Aman collection. Zoe means life in Greek, so they chose that name for it. That's located in Kranivi, Greece. And here's a beautiful example of kind of a four-star boutique hotel in Mani, Greece, which is another beautiful seaside town. This one is called Aria State. So additional kind of things to do in the Peloponnese, um, there's the castle town of Monum Vasia. It's actually a separate island that was separated by an earthquake. Um, so there's a little bridge to it and you can visit the medieval castle. Um, you can follow the towns in ancient history and ancient literature like Mycenae and Homer's Odyssey. You can visit Epidavros, the ancient theater, uh, the seaside town of Nafplio, the Corinth Canal in ancient Corinth, and uh, Mani, which was the village I showed you before, or you could visit the Lichava Cave. So there's really beautiful things to do all along the Peloponnese Peninsula. Corfu is another uh, region. It's an Ionian island. It only accounts for about 5% of the olive oil production, but it's known for its family-friendly atmosphere and a really cool Venetian fortress. So this is actually a, a hotel lobby of the Domes Hotel in Corfu. And this is a living 2000 year old olive tree built that was built around it. And this property was actually owned by the Onassis family. And it was where Jackie O frequented and spent her summers when they were together. Um, it's known for its famous blue bar, which uh, hosted a lot of dignitaries back in the day. So we're going to talk about one of my favorite places to go in Corfu. It's an olive oil mill called The Governor. 
tell you about that here. Okay, so, and the governor is one of Greece's premier olive oils. It's known to have 10 times more polyphenols uh, than most olive oils, uh, which contain a lot of anti-inflammatory, antioxidant uh, qualities. And it's been used in treatment of diabetes, Alzheimer's, breast cancer, and lung cancer. So it's pretty cool. Um, they're using that uh, in medical advancement. So another sight to see in Corfu is the Achillion Palace, which was the palace of Princess Sisi, the Empress of Hungary. So this was her kind of summer place and a place to get away when um, she was ill. They wanted her in a more temperate climate, so they brought her to Corfu. So other things to do, as I mentioned, visit the palace and the courtyard of muses. Um, you could enjoy a cocktail in the blue bar where I mentioned celebrities, dignitaries, and royalties uh, shared at the Domes Hotel. You can discover the island by bike, set sail on a day cruise with lunch and drinks, or climb the fortress of Corfu Town, where, as I mentioned in the beginning, you can actually see uh, where Albania is. So the last uh, Greek destination, which is where we'll build our four day, uh, begin our four days of our itinerary, is Crete. So that accounts for 30% of the olive oil production in Greece. It is the largest Greek island. It's about four hours uh, coast to coast. Um, really unique culture and cuisine in Crete. If anybody's been to Greece and has had Cretan food, you can kind of tell the difference. It's famous for its mountain villages, Minoan ruins and beaches. The Minoans are credited as being the first European civilization actually and the second largest region for um, olive oil production, where there are many organic farms, vineyards, and olive oil estates that you can visit. So this is where we begin our itinerary. So we'll start you off with four nights in Crete at an old Venetian palace converted to a boutique hotel in old town Hanya. So in Hanya, a lot of the Italian families uh, that were wealthy came to summer home. So there are some beautiful mansions and estates that are now hotels. Uh, while you're staying in Crete, you'll dive into an olive oil and culinary experience at an 18th century olive oil mill, and you'll cook unique recipes with Cretan herbs. And then lastly, you'll set sail on a wooden boat to the island of pirates, Rambuza, and this Balus Lagoon, where you'll swim and enjoy lunch on board. So here are some views of inside the boutique hotel in the Venetian mansion. And of course, beautiful rooftop views to the old town and harbor. And here is Balos Lagoon, where I mentioned you'll take a boat ride there. And there are some additional things to do in Crete, which um, you feel free to talk to your travel advisors about trading any activities out, maybe something speaks to you more. Um, so there's an organic farm and a cheese workshop. There's some uniquely Cretan cheeses like Mazithra, um, which are just so delicious. Um, beekeeping at a local apiary, wine tasting at a converted monastery. There's a beautiful gorge and waterfall. So there's hiking and active things if you're into that. Um, you can do lunch in ancient villages like this one featured here. There are a few beautiful colored villages um, like taking a step back in time. 
you can actually learn some Minoan, ancient Minoan recipes and do a cooking course and pottery making. We can actually take the vessel home with you and learn the art of phyllo dough opening. So we're gonna show you a video of this. this is a 86 year old man who lives in the which is a town not too far from Kanya. And he actually rolls his own dough still by hand. He's been doing it for 50 years. So that was a bit on uh, Greece. Now we're gonna switch gears and talk about Italy. So as you saw there, there's a sampling of all the cool things you can do. Um, a lot of that was based in Tuscany, which we'll talk about. Um, so we'll start with uh, Modena, which is a city in Emilia-Romagna, which is known for its balsamic vinegar. Often, if you look at your authentic balsamic, and maybe Joe can attest to that, it often says Modena on it. Um, the town is also known for its auto producing prowess. So we've they're known for Maserati. It's where uh, Ferrari is from. And it's also a foodie haven. The Osteria Francescana restaurant by Massimo Bottura has three Michelin stars and people come from all over the place to um, eat in this little town. One of the dishes from his, I thought that was super cool the way it looks like a <laughs> fish. All right, then um, Puglia and Calabria. It's uh, known for 82% of where the olive oil is made in Southern Italy. So 68% of it is uh, specifically in that region. So this is a, a photograph of Puglia. These are the Truly homes, Truly the, I'll probably say Albero Bello. And these are specific homes found in this region. Another view of beautiful Puglia by the sea. So beyond the Southern area, the remainder of olive oil production is mainly in Sicily, Campania, and these other regions. Tuscany only makes up for 3%, but it still is a beloved place to visit because not only for the olive oil production, but for the wine and in general, it's um, culinary tours. So these are actually photos um, that I took when I was visiting at this gorgeous property. So we'll add on to the four nights in Crete with three nights at this property near Mantolcino at a 17th century farmhouse estate turned into a luxury boutique hotel called Lupaia. It's gorgeous. Um, from here, you'll explore Pienza. You'll see the famous cypress lined road where parts of Gladiator were filmed. You'll visit a local Pecorino farm and sample fresh cheeses, breads and spreads and also enjoy a local wine tasting another day, um, the famous Brunello di Montalcino wine. If anyone's big on Italian wines, you, I'm sure you'd probably know that. It's one of the most famous wines from the Tuscan region. And you'll also get to visit Montalcino. 
Here's another view of the hotel. So this is actually, again, photos from when I was there. I actually captured this guy. He was coming up fresh from the garden right underneath the farm. It's set on a hill. So all the animals in the garden is actually beneath and they by foot go up and down every day. He's bringing up some fresh basil from the garden. And this was uh, my, my group, my family. We did a tasting there and uh, it was just incredible, fresh. I mean, it doesn't get more farm to table than this. In Pienza, that's a beautiful town nearby. This is actually a picture of what the shops look like in there. They have cheese and tons of olive oils and things on the, um, on the shelves. And, and it's still a, a beautiful quaint town. And here you can actually see the, uh, the cypress lined road where it was filmed from the gladiator on his, when he was dreaming of returning home. And this is a view from Pienza. You, you'd be able to see something like this there. So then you would continue with a wine tasting. Um, this is in the Montalcino, again, area. You can see the, the kind of mountains and hills behind. And it's, it was just a very authentic, you know, tasting. As you can see, the dogs and the animals come right up to you. It's just a, a simple table, but set out in nature. It's not a fancy tasting room, um, but it's just super authentic. The, it's still a family owned business. They explain um, how they make the wine. You can go directly into their seller and it's just an amazing private experience. And uh, other things to do in Tuscany, um, as you can see from my goat friend here, you can visit Cashmere Goat Farm, see how that is made and what kind of goats they use for that. Medieval Castle and Crystal Workshop, um, there's truffle hunting with trained dogs, hands-on pasta making experience, you could meet a modern day Geppetto and his workshop and a farm to table under the Tuscan sun lunch. So there's many things to do there. I'm interested to know if anybody wants to write in the chat, how many people have already done, you know, Italy or Greece? Is it a bucket list for you? Have you been once? Have you been twice? I'd love to know. And lastly, one of my favorite places in, in Italy is Ravello. So many people know of Amalfi and Positano and the famous towns, um, you know, directly along the water. But Ravello is my favorite place because it's really a gem. It's set further above the coastline and just offers incredible views. And it still has a, a very old world appeal. It's known for its famous Villa Cimbrone and the Terrace of Infinity, which have recently been featured in Wonder Woman and the movie Tenet, if anyone saw that and understood it. <laughs> but um, there were scenes in that um, as well. So in Ravello, there were, we're gonna start with uh, three nights at a converted convent with sweeping views of the Amalfi Coast. So that um, I believe that building was made in like the 12, 1280. Um, you'll explore the grounds of Villa Cimbrone followed by an evening pizza making and wine tasting experience. In Italy, wine is always uh, part of the experience no matter where you go. And you, you can take in the colorful coast by water as you cruise the Amalfi on a private boat. So here's the, it's, it's, it doesn't even do it justice in pictures, but here's a picture of the Terrace of Infinity, um, which is set on an incredibly steep cliff um, off of Villa Cimbroni's property. And that's actually a scene from Wonder Woman with a lot of CGI, but you can still tell it was filmed there. And beyond that in Ravello, this is a actual clients of mine. They went and did a pizza making course. They absolutely loved it. They put it in the oven themselves and had a really fun time um, with the brothers who have that. And beside Ravello is known for its incredible pottery. So as you kind of meander the, the shops and the town, you can buy pottery, bring it home with you. And oftentimes they'll ship larger vessels for you. Here is, um, if you're interested in a five-star property, this recently made Travel and Leisure's um, top 500 hotels in the world. Um, it's the Palazzo Avino. And it's also a, a beautiful property if you don't wanna stay there uh, during the duration, you could at least go for a dinner or a drink and experience um, its beautiful terrace there. 
And on your last day, I think it's absolutely necessary you see the Amalfi by, by boat. So you'll go along the towns, Maiore, Preano, and see all of the beautiful um, towns while you enjoy some Prosecco on board. All right, and that concludes our 10 day adventure in Italy and Greece. We've gotten quite a few responses in the chat. I know it's hard. I to bet. I just keep that. seeing them pop up, Maria. So tell us. Yeah. Um, Do I've share. Got to, I've got to scroll back up a little bit. Um, let's see here. Yep. And uh, we've had a few people say you can never return too many times. And we totally agree mm -hmm. with that. True story. <laughs> Diana has been to Greece and Italy is on her list. We've got Linda who's been twice to Italy and uh, she's planning Greece for the first time. She's already been to Moderna, Siena, and Ravello. Uh, oh, Christine was in Tuscany in 2019. Debbie's going to Sicily in 2022. Yay. Deborah's been to both a few times. Um, Joan's been to many regions in Italy. Let's see here. Chris W. Once in Tuscany and Verona and Como. Interested in going to the uh, Cycladis. Mm -hmm. I apologize, guys. I'm scrolling through a lot of. Lot yeah, of I, I just want to also mention um, maybe Candace, you want to expand on how long you you want to offer this if we're if we're doing two weeks, but we do want to offer exclusively to your group um, free transfers to and from airports as I'm part of booking this experience. Yes, I know we talked about that. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate you offering that to our group. Yeah, I, I would like to, and I think I love the, the culinary um, inspiration of everything. And I, you know, these are all ideas. Um, Candace and Maria and the team will circulate a sample itinerary um, that you guys can get inspired from, but we're happy to customize it if you want to change hotels or if any of the experiences I mentioned caught your eye, we can certainly trade those in. So even if you don't do exactly that itinerary, um, we'll work that bonus into any trips um, made through us for that duration. Great. So if you want to um, share the screen back to Maria, we can um, flip over to the tasting portion. All right, Candace, yeah. I am sending it over to you. You are now the host, my dear. All right, so hopefully you can see us and we're coming in. Yep, see you in here. Hearing us okay? Oh, yep. Okay, wonderful. So as I had mentioned at the beginning, I am here uh, in the Partridge Creek uh, facility and we're gonna start um, just by having Joe walk through oil tasting, it's very, um, approachable here. So um, what's so great about Joe is I came in, well, I've been coming here for a while, getting my oils and stuff here just because my husband is Greek and um, we do a lot of home cooking. He's the chef at our house. I'm the sous chef. <laughs> and we cook with a lot of different oils and vinegars and those kinds of things. So this is a, a frequent stop for our family. So Joe, would you want to get started? Well, thank you again for having me and uh, for joining. So some beautiful visuals we saw, some great lead-ins, Christina uh, with Crete and uh, Modena. Uh, so now let's do some tasting, let's have some fun with it. So, yeah. uh, I'll talk a little bit about the oils and vinegars kind of as we're tasting, but I like to just jump right into the tasting. Sure. And then if there's questions later, I can, can answer some questions. And if you don't have your kit yet, don't uh, fret. As Joe mentioned there were some last minute people that bought some stuff. Or if you're seeing this uh, recorded and you want to buy the oils, you can always go online and do that as well. So, yeah. so we have a little uh, the kit right here that you see has our collection of oils and vinegars. Uh, and we're coming out and taste them together, walk through, and we have your little packet that, uh, that some of you have purchased. Um, about uh, what's in the kit, how to taste aloe like a pro, which we'll do that together. Uh, then we'll go through, uh, also in the kit is about the Arbequina olive oil from California. Yeah, and I'm just going to hold this one up here so you guys can see that. This is the Arbequina that we're going to start with. And it, it obviously was in a sampling little bottle, but that's the one we're going to start with. He's going to pour it right out of the... So then there's a, a little tasting notes of the, the two oils that we're going to taste, uh, of the uh, Arbequina, the Calamara, the Tuscan herb, the blood orange, and then we'll do some 
it's a vinegar tasting dish. So we'll get started. So we'll start with the arbequina. Uh, so this is typically a Spanish aloe, but this is grown crushed in California. Um, interesting enough, olive oil, the, the fresher, the better. Uh, right. So regions are, are classic and historical, and the, the varietals uh, give influence to the taste of your olive oil, uh, but freshness is very key too. Right. So I wanted to start with a nice mild, mild olive oil for you. And unlike wine, when you age it, obviously you want this, the fresher, the better. So. Yeah, olive oil is very perishable. So air, heat, and light hurt your oil. So you want to keep it uh, corked up and sealed and away from, away from light. And one of the interesting things that you'll find if you Google oil tasting is a lot of times you'll see these clear blue glasses that they use. And Joe, do you want to explain um, what that's all about? So there are professional olive oil tasters. And you saw in some of the uh, videos from Christina. Uh, typically, an olive oil panel is eight to ten people. They are professional tasters. It's a learned skill too, uh, so don't don't be uh, afraid if we can't smell or taste together what we uh, what some of the descriptions are. It's kind of a, a learned behavior. Uh, but typically, they do olive oil tastings early in the morning, so there's no uh, coffee, no uh, no smoking. It doesn't influence your sensory uh, abilities uh, uh, of the oil. And uh, they typically use blue olive oil tasting cups uh, because. Uh, olive oils have different colors. Let me see if I can. You know, these are the two we're going to taste here. There's the calamata, which is a little darker green, and the arbequina is a little, uh, a little bit more yellow. The color doesn't mean uh, it's a better quality or not. It's just the different varietals of olives, and uh, sometimes they're more bitter if they're darker. But um, it doesn't mean it's a, a, a better or worse oil. Uh, and those blue cups are there so that you don't see the oil and prejudge it before you actually taste it. So, okay, so we poured our arbequina. Everyone's kind of in the same boat. Who's got, the, who's got the tasting kit? So now we're gonna kind of step through how to taste olive oil like a pro. Okay. So we poured a couple uh, tablespoons into our tasting cup. We're gonna cup it with one hand. What we're doing is we're trapping in the aroma um, of the olive oil. And we're gonna take our other hand and kind of rub the bottom. And what you're doing is you're just warming up the oil. You're just kind of swishing it around. You can see. I'm trying not to get oil all over my hand. <laughs> okay, once you warm it up, you keep your hand cupped. You don't want to, you want to release that aroma. And you bring it to your nose and you smell it. I don't know if we can type in what kind of what kind of uh, aromatics do you do you smell? I smell like um like a grass. Grass, yep. Like a little bit of a grassy smell, like um. So should have a good olive oil, should have a nice kind of fresh, fresh aroma. Yeah, um, it, it does smell very fresh. Either fresh We had some fresh citrus pepper. listed too. Citrus, yeah. There's a, uh, sometimes it's floral, sometimes it's citrus. Um, yeah, I always say if it smells waxy or like crayons, Not good. It's, it's a bad oil already. So it's probably uh, oxidized and then because it's going rancid. So if it smells like crayons. Throw it away. <laughs> Throw it out. <laughs> okay, so now what that does is it gives you your senses a kind of some clues of what the oil is going to taste like. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw it in our mouth and we're going to be pretend like no one's around you and slurp it really loud. We're going to aerate it in your mouth. So here we go. Yes. And then and then swap them. What you're doing is you're <clears throat> oh so <laughs> It gives you that coughing <laughs> sensation. And that's a good Sometimes thing. He said, my water. he said, when we did this for the very first time, I, I started coughing and I was like, oh, don't think I have anything. I'm okay. <laughs> so so that, that method of kind of aerating is called the strabagio. Okay. It's, uh, you're essentially atomizing or vaporizing it. You're, you're coating your, 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 all of your saliva in the mouth with, mm -hmm. with that olive oil to get all your senses that you need to taste it. Yeah, and it's a little bit of a creamy flavor that I think this one particularly mm -hmm. has. It's yep. light, it's light and creamy. The arbequina typically has kind of a creamy texture. That's uh, kind of a note of the varietal itself. But um, um, as you taste different oils, uh, some of them are, it's funny to say it's not, uh, the, not the texture to touch, but the, the sense in your mouth has been creamy. Right. Um, so that peppery feel that you get in the throat, that's actually a good sign. Uh, Christina mentioned the polyphenols. So those are your, your healthy antioxidants that good olive oil has. So a grocery store olive oil, you can find some good ones in the grocery store, don't, don't get me wrong, but 
Um, but uh, a lot of those are refined oils and typically they're depleted of polyphenols. So your health benefits, your two health benefits. So you want good fresh olive oil um, picked at the right harvest, crushed and, and processed and extracted in the right method um, will give you higher polyphenols. Early harvest, uh, early harvest olives need to do uh, higher polyphenol counts as well. But, uh, but consuming olive oil for the pure health benefits, um, good fresh extra virgin olive oil is very important. And that lingering feel you get it is a good sign also. So. Yeah, a little bit of a warm, creamy feeling. So, so all right, so all right. we're gonna move on to the next one. So we're gonna move on to the, the Kalamata from Greece. And again, it's a little darker here. Again, the, the color doesn't mean it's any better or worse, just a different, different color. We do a little heavy pour. Yeah, heavy. All right, you want to take us through this one? Yeah, we're, so I'm just warming it up, as he said before, and I have it cupped. It's kind of because these cups are a little tiny, but yeah. you can figure it out. I've done it a few times with these cups. Yeah, he, he's a pro. I'm, I'm still getting oil all over my hand when I'm doing it, but bear with us. So again, we're, we're covering, trapping, trapping in the aroma. As you heat up the oil, it's going to be some more aromatics of the oil itself. You know, 20 seconds swishing it around, bring it to your nose. I smell pepper. So it should have a distinct smell or a different smell to it. Yeah. Still fresh, but uh, a little more, a little more, uh, a little more grass smell to me, maybe yeah. a little minty, a little, uh, a little stronger, a little more pungency. Yeah, I think that's what it is. It's the pungent smell that I smell. And, and don't, Strong. don't feel like you have to smell where we're smelling it. Uh, everyone has different senses uh, and, and, and a lot of, Professionals perfect this over over time, so I'm I wouldn't say I'm a professional, but I've, I've tasted <laughs> somewhere. So, okay. okay, so now we're going to do the fun word strapaggio. Strapaggio. Here we go. We're take it at home. <coughs> How is this one? <laughs> okay. Hot. Ooh. There is some heat in the back of the mouth. That peppercorn, like from. You know, black pepper is anybody, the best way for me to describe it. Any, anybody cough on the, on the cough? Any coughers? Maybe. <laughs> Nobody's admitting it. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so. So your first assumption might be, wow, that's a terrible oil. <laughs> <laughs> it's strong. Oh, we have one of our oh. guests who had made some croutons for snacking and salads by tossing some uh, torn up bread in the kalamata oil and then garlic, yeah. salt, and oregano and baked them to be crispy. Yeah. That sounds great. So Wonderful the, use. So the taste is a little bit, a little stronger. I wanted to do the Kalamata. I wanted to do uh, the Arbicino is mild and the Kalamata is robust. Yeah. And uh, those are two kind of different ends of the spectrum from, uh, from mild to, uh, to robustness and to give you a feel. So it's, it's um, those robust ones are maybe less popular because we're just not used to good olive oil here um, in the states. It maybe makes if you cry a little bit, well, melt here. Or water eyes, and mm -hmm. sometimes we say it's a one cough oil, two cough oil, three cough oil, mm -hmm. and that's related to the robustness. And that's really directly related to the, the polyphenol count in the olive oil, health, health benefits, uh, and then also uh, certain certain polyphenols uh, like oleocanthal. Is one that gives you that kind of the string scene in the throat. That, that it, isn't it important for that not to heat the olive oil up too much because we'll actually strip out that, burn it, right? So, so with olive oil is a low heat oil, you know, mm -hmm. 360 to 400 your smoke point, uh, but it's still good to cook with. Mm -hmm. um, but with any oil, and when you heat it up, you just naturally um, uh, heat out or extract some of the health benefits of the oil. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, a lot of people say finishing oil. Right. Um, so it's fantastic for finishing. But, um, uh, but from a health benefits, if you start with a very healthy oil mm -hmm. um, and you cook out a little bit, it's still much healthier than, than if than you an were oil just using, yeah, like yeah. a vegetable oil or something. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah, yeah. So, perfect. Okay. So that's that's uh, um, kind of a quick quick tasting. Um, again, there's, there's different chemistry behind it. So actually, extra virgin oil is the first pressing uh, mechanically uh, expressed the oil. Uh, so there's a lot of definitions and chemistry goes behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have questions, I can answer. But uh, that's kind of the fun part of tasting. Sure, sure. We're going to taste one of the flavored olive oils, uh, the Tuscan herb, probably our uh, most popular. Uh, yeah, kind of looks like the Arbicina a little bit. Camera so they can see. There you go. There yeah. you go, the Tuscan herb. So this starts out as one of what we say our regional or varietal olive oil, so nice mild oil like the Arbicina. Uh, then the essential oils are infused in 
uh, to the oil. So there's no floating herbs or spices or anything. It's all, uh, it's a proprietary process of uh, infusing. It. So it's all done at the same time as they're pressing the oil? Nope, not as, not as they're pressing um, uh, afterwards. Okay. Uh, as a, as an after fusion. Okay. Ooh, but this Ooh, one you can really smell yeah, this, this one, one. You don't have to go through the tasting. That tasting is really for yeah. for unflavored, what we call uh, bride, different bridles, uh, yeah. extra virgin olive oil. So te one. technically, these are still extra virgin olive oils, but to be true to the definition, anytime you add anything, uh, it's technically not an extra virgin olive oil. Then, okay. so it's still uh, made from extra virgin olive oil, has all the properties of it, but to be true to the definition, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a flavored olive oil. Sure, sure. But uh, this one, you just just take a, a just a good 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 smell. This one is instantly lovable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This tastes like the or smells like the what a uh, garlic bread would taste like coming out of the oven. So the best way for me to describe this for those of you that don't have the oil kit is that smell of your grandma's um, homemade garlic bread that they slather all the oil and butter and everything on. It's really what it smells like. So this is this is the fantastic bread dipper or it's been a nice bruschetta recipe that yeah. uh, that we have. Um, yeah. You could put it. I put it on steaks. Um, oh, that would be Before I grill idea. and marinate with some spices. Mm. Um, but but this you can just just kind of sip it and taste. It. Mm. And this, the flavors are so pronounced. This would be great on any meat, really, too. It's uh, that's kind of the go-to for yeah. almost anything. You yeah, absolutely. Fish, chicken, anything. Great. Uh, we, we won't taste this one together just for time, but the blood orange uh, is uh, what we call an uh, agramato style, uh, meaning it's two fruits crushed together. The olive is a fruit, the orange is a fruit, and they're crushed at the same time. Um, so you get that, that strong citrus flavor. And, uh, and again, nothing's added at all except for those two fruits, the blood oranges and the olives at the same time. Uh, Nice citrus uh, citrus oil. My mom uses it in her pancakes. She, oh, she wow. loves it. Uh, she's, yeah. she's made up a pasta sauce. Gives a little different different citrus flavor to your sauce. It's some oh, kind of unique idea. application. Yeah, yeah. So try that one. Uh, try that one on your own. Um, but uh, but fantastic as well. So we taste. Hey Joe, reason, uh, can I ask you a question? Because I course. for some for some reason as a panelist I can't type the question. I don't know why. Um, but uh, one of the things I'm always concerned about is opening a bottle of a very nice olive oil and then not using it all up. So what do you suggest to prolong the life of the olive oil once it's opened, uh, if you're not cooking with it every day? A fantastic question. So when you, when you travel to all these locations that, uh, that, that were, that were uh, Christina showed, and so people like to buy a nice bottle of oil and then they save it because it's special. Don't do that. Don't do it. <laughs> <You'll> <laughs> Take do it, it home. <laughs> Yeah, take it home, use it, and enjoy it because it's it's uh, when it's crushed, that's the best that's going to be, and only uh, over time it just slowly slowly degrades. You lose the health benefits, you lose the flavor. So uh, air, air, uh, air, heat, and light are, is what hurts your oil. So keep it in a, a stainless steel container is preferred. Uh, something where the light can't get it uh, away from any heat sources. So a lot, of, a lot of us like to put it next to the stove as we're cooking. Or you can show stove. the bottles. He sells them in our darker color. Oh, here we go. There's some yep. down here. So it's um, to keep it, yep, air, heat, and light again. So a uh, dark bottle, stainless steel is great if you have it. Um, and then uh, keep it keep it corked up when you're not using it. And that'll keep it fresh as long as, but if you, when you get your good bottle when you travel, come home and then use it and enjoy it. Don't save it. Yeah. We, we get that a lot. I, I've had this for two years and I just really want to save it for a special moment. You can save the wine for a little bit, but, but yeah. enjoy, enjoy your olive oil. Yeah. The wine and the vinegar stay. The oil. So yeah. how long does olive oil keep, in your opinion? Yep. So uh, I might always say a year and a half is a good, is a year to year and a half is a good rule. So, um, but your some of your more robust oils with the, the more antioxidant counts, mm -hmm. um, they actually help protect the oil. Um, so it, it, it's good for your body, the health benefits, but it also helps protect the oil itself. So you got a nice robust oil, it's going to have a little bit stronger shelf life also. Okay. So again, if I say, if I open it up and it smells waxy or like crayons, it's probably gone bad already. But if you still get that kind of nice fresh aroma. Or the cough or the crying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those are good signs. <laughs> so it, the, uh, it's an excellent question. It gives you a lot of information. So. Uh, you always try to find the most recent harvest date. So Northern Hemisphere, uh, October, November, December is your, your crush, your harvest. 
uh, south of the equator is uh, it, you know, April, May, June is your harvest. So typically you're not gonna find a harvest on a bottle. Um, they have uh, expiration dates now, right. uh, which, is, which is a good start, but really you wanna, you wanna know the crush date of, of your oil. There you go. And so we're going to do a couple of vinegars too. We're going to talk about the aging of the vinegars because that is the opposite. So you yeah. got to go long on the, yep. the real your, good stuff. Your vinegars <laughs> uh, are not going to go bad. <laughs> so you can get, you can buy a nice uh, bottle from Modena. Yeah, this is a, this is our traditional 18 year dark balsamic. Uh, to be very true to the definition, this is a condimento. Um, it, and the reason why it's a condimento. Yep. So this is this is the this is a bottle from uh, this is a DOP uh, a Cito Balsamico uh, from uh, from Modena DOP uh, protected origin origin of designation, um, but um, uh, the only ingredient whatsoever in a DOP the protected origin of designation is grape must. That's it, um, and it comes from the two 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 towns in the world the one that uh, Christina showed us in Modena and the neighboring town uh, Reggio Emilia. So those are the only two towns in the world where true balsamic vinegar comes from. And if they put, say it's balsamic, it's really not. It's like calling champagne or sparkling wine yeah. champagne, right? Yep, it's, like the sh yeah. true champagne comes from the champagne region of yeah. France. But yep, it's similar. So we are tasting a traditional 18-year dark balsamic. Uh, to be very little, it's a kind of um, the It's very close uh, in uh, density and sweetness um, as, a, as a DOP from Modena. Um, but it's but it's a kind of it has a little bit of wine vinegar in it to kind of speed up that fermentation process. So our balsamics are aged in wooden barrels. You take the grape pressings, the grape musts, and you put them in the, to wood barrels. Uh, there'd be oak, chestnut, mulberry, ash barrels. And uh, as that balsamic vinegar is is aged, and we know if we can see that picture up there, yeah. there's different size barrels and. Uh, and over the years, the, the seasons, the barrels expand and contract and it pulls some of the character from the barrels into your balsamic vinegar. Um, and, and that's how you get some really rich food. So now we're gonna, we're gonna pour a little in a cup. We're gonna, we're gonna drink it, but we're gonna let it sit on our tongue for a little bit and just kind of let it dissolve in your mouth and then, and then swallow it. Sweet. Very, very good. <laughs> I can't hear uh, Heidi's audio, but I think she said very good. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. What I can um, uh, say too, too, is there's like a, a tang, like a tangy um, flavor and um, sweet and tangy all at the same time. Very, very good. And you can tell why it's great on tomatoes, right? Because with the acid, yep. you know, and the salt from feta, because I put it on my my feta, calamata, olives, and the tomato, and this is my salad most nights <laughs> with the So with the balsamic. a good balsamic uh, is, is, is real rich and sweet. Mm -hmm. uh, acidity is fairly low, you know, mm -hmm. in that, that 4%, 4.5% range. Uh, so it's really nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. Again, we're, loose, we're used to uh, grocery store vinegar, which right. has just a lot of wine vinegar in it. And right. that acidity is like 6%. Right. And that really strong bites. So right. When people come into the shop, they're really surprised to taste uh, how smooth, rich, and sweet it is. Right. And that's, I think, the biggest difference between buying from a local uh, you know, place that sells quality, you know, high quality versus just a lot of the grocery store that's mass produced. Um, you know, nothing against Costco because I know everybody there's can get good, it. There's some good vinegars out there. Sure. <laughs> but, yeah. But, um, but yeah, really, really good, really tasty. Thank you. So that, that was a dark balsamic. I know we're, we're probably closing uh, close to time here. I'm not sure, but uh, we'll, we'll taste a white balsamic. Uh, so the Sicilian lemon. Um, this is made, uh, what's the difference? It's a, it's a white grape must. It's a white Triviano grape. Uh, still aged in wooden barrels. Again, this is a white balsamic. Oh, you can smell the lemon. Woo. Even in the smell, you can smell it just a little bit more acidic. Just yeah, in the smell itself. and that's my favorite. I think I was telling you how I'm, I I uh, love lemon. sour everything. <laughs> Lemons in the morning with my water, so very good. And you can actually put this in sparkling water, a okay, tablespoon yeah. or two. And in, uh, in your sparkling water of our balsamics, and it's just a nice refreshing drink and healthy. So, so, all right, so we'll put this on our tongue and dissolve. 
Mm. You really taste that citrus and all the pucker. Pucker power. Yep. The pucker power from the lemon. We say sweet and tart. There's yeah, it's like a tart. sweet, like a sweet tart. <laughs> that's, Ooh, a, that's yummy. So those are a couple examples uh, of our balsamics. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. So are there any questions that uh, we have in regards to any of the oils or the vinegar? Yeah, there are a few. Um, let's see, I've got them written down here. So, oh, I'm sorry, the oil and vinegar. No, you uh, were answering them as some of them came in. So that was great. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. We do have a few questions though for Christina that came in. Sure. But before we get to that, is there anything else you wanted to check or add with that before I like switch back to the trip portion? No, I think we're good. We just wanted to make sure everybody had an opportunity to ask questions and, and know that if you still um, want to order the the oil or the vinegars, it's obviously available on the site too. Yeah, and we'll send that link out in our follow-up from the virtual vacation as well. Okay, Great. so a few questions that came in. One was um, for the destinations that you mentioned for both Greece and Italy, is there a specific time of year that it's better to visit those? That is a good question. Um, it depends on what you're looking to do, um, how you want to spend your vacation if you're um, a beach lover and it's really important to do you know the the cruises and and things like that I would say stick within the kind of May to September range summer is very hot and is very crowded uh, July and August are the most popular months and with popular uh, and tourism also come um, the price. So I personally recommend to, you know, when I like to go, I, what I recommend to friends, family, and my clients is like May and September are really lovely. Um, it also depends on if you, you know, if you're interested in visiting in winter, um, Greece has lovely mountain villages and is really beautiful. Um, Athens is gorgeous at Christmas time. As many of you saw, they just had snow, which hasn't happened in like 12 years. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just the fall, the change of season, it, there's really, I, I'd say Greece is beautiful year round, but people tend to go spring and fall. Okay. And then another question that came in was, all right, um, one of our guests mentioned about visiting the Kirklandic okay. Islands. And so what's the best way to visit them? Great question. To the Kikladic one specifically? Yes. Yes. So I always recommend um, everybody, you know, it's a bucket list trip for a reason. There's a destination you've been pining for, be it Santorini often is at the top or Mykonos. Um, I recommend taking one island that you really want to visit and combining that with another island or two um, that might be a little less popular just to get a really authentic experience. And also to, you know, the most popular ones, again, will be the priciest. And sometimes they're not as authentic. So I love combining Mykonos or Santorini with islands like Naxos. Uh, Naxos actually has some really cool ruins. Um, it's known for its marble. It has gorgeous beaches. I also love Syros. It's a little more cosmopolitan. It's actually the capital of the class. A lot of Greeks really live there year round. So you get a very, um, you know, kind of local feel going there. I mean, there's so many. I could, I could go on and on. But I would say to get the most um, authentic experience and best value for money, mix some of the lesser known ones with uh, one or two of the ones that you really want to go to, depending on time. And don't try to do too much at once. Enjoy where you're at. Ferry rides take four or five hours. Um, you know, it's just stay at least, I always suggest staying at least three nights if you can to really get a feel for the place. Yeah, because if you try to pack too much in, you're going to need a vacation from your vacation when you get home. And, yeah. you know, if you spend more time on a particular island, you're really getting to see and experience it. Um, well, I guess that's true of any vacation, but definitely with the islands. Um, there's another question that came in asking about a little bit um, of a broader sense, like with the Mediterranean diet, religion and philosophy sites, anthropology, um, archaeology, that kind of thing. We, Christina did another Greece itinerary or overview for us. It is in our Facebook group. I'll post that link again 
But I can tell you, um, being a Greek descent, most of the country is Greek Orthodox. And you find a lot of churches throughout the entire country, as well as the islands. Um, when the last time I was there, which it's been a while, and my cousins are very not happy with me for that, we got to, my sister and I got to visit the site of Akrotiri on the island of Santorini, where basically they believe that um, that whole area had been washed out by the volcano. So, I mean, just like fun stuff like that. And there is a lot more to do. And for more specifics and what you're looking for, please reach out to one of the advisors here tonight because we can help answer your specific questions. Greece for being such a small country really has a lot to offer. Right, and there's different ways to oh, see it too. There's different ways you can see it. If some people, I've had a, a couple of, um, couples actually rent a yacht and go from one island to the other. And because they uh, have the yacht to themselves, they can decide how many days they wanna stay at one particular place versus another if they happen to really like the area. I've got one more question about visiting Greece. And then I do have a couple that came in for, um, for Joe as well. So the last question I have so far, um, can you participate in a harvest of the olives like you can with wine? Yes, um, oh. actually the season in Greece is typically November. So that's also nice. It's something to come to do kind of in what we call shoulder season. It's toward the end of tourism season. So you can get a really reasonably priced vacation, but then you can also visit and do something a little different than the typical vacation. So the olive harvest is in November and you'll often see them with these huge rakes and, and cloths just kind of raking it up. So that's pretty interesting to see. And you also mentioned the wine harvest, um, Crete, which we presented in the vacation. Um, you can actually participate in the wine harvest there in many places throughout Greece. And that's uh, typically in September. So two really cool things. Um, just make sure you ask your advisor ahead of time and, and you know, we can plan it around um, a specific place to where, you, where you'd like to go. And what the perf you know, such a perfect reason to go back twice. Take yeah, exactly. <laughs> just you know, stay from those. September to just November. Stay. <laughs> you know how you can, can work, work that happen. from wherever you're vacationing? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Just take too many positive COVID tests and you'll just yeah. <laughs> you have yeah. to stay what, what a horrible with place the, to with have to quarantine. quarantine. <laughs> Thanks, Christina. Uh, Joe, we've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, one of our guests was asking if you could repeat how long the balsamic vinegars will last on a shelf. Yeah. So true balsamic vinegar is indefinite. It, uh, it's not gonna go bad. Um, so we, uh, it's just great must. Uh, and that's the only ingredient. So you don't have to refrigerate it. You don't have to, um, um, yeah, store. And you've had some of these. This one, yeah. these are some older ones. Yeah, so this, this uh, Mogana is, is, is actually aged 25 years. Um, and this is an 18 year uh, from uh, original email as well. So um, indefinite shelf life for vinegars. Okay. And Joan is asking, she says she lives in California and has heard that some of the California olives, olive oils surpass Greek and Italy. What is your yeah. opinion? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So uh, we, we classically think of uh, Italy and, and Greece as like the olive oil. And it's, it's true, it's fantastic oil. Um, but the, you can make good oil. Uh, you can make good oil everywhere. But uh, there is some really uh, good uh, mill groves and mills uh, in the states here. Uh, California in particular has its own California certification as well. So they're really, um, really pushing the quality uh, in California and they have some good, some good oil. And that's, that's where the Sarmikin is from actually. So yeah, so it's freshness is key, but uh, the, the unique thing about olive oil is it picks up the surrounding vegetation. So certain regional areas uh, will have different flavors to them. So that's what's that's what's fun about the, right. the local the locality of the yeah. region. Of it. Yeah. yeah, the terroir makes a difference. So. Mm -hmm. And we've got another question. Is there any difference in care or storage between balsamic vinegar and glaze? Ooh, good question. Mm -hmm. um, so your glazes, if you if you get a glaze in a store, uh, definitely read the label. Uh, a lot of times they put thickeners, homogenizers in them, and uh, just a ton of sugar. And it's like a really manufactured product. Um, whereas uh, balsamic vinegar, true balsamic, right, is 
all it is is great pressings and it, and it gets thicker as it ages. Um, you can actually reduce uh, your balsamic, uh, we say low and slow on a stove and thicken it up a little bit. And that's like your own reduction. Um, so I, I, I guess I, I can't say from a grocery store, you know, what, what they put in them that might have a shelf life or they need to be refrigerated. Um, so that's a tough one to answer. So check the labels. Check the labels. Yeah, yeah. I, typically, I try to I try to get a clean label, right? Less uh, less uh, uh, ingredients and everything you can pronounce and as so healthy as you can. Stuff so, you know what it means. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hopefully I answered that <laughs> well. Yeah. yeah. Well, unfortunately, not all things are, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, not all of these are created equal. Yeah, yeah. Do I have any last questions from those of you who are still on with us? Okay, again, for those of you who um, are interested in checking out Christina's prior uh, webinar with us on Greece, I am putting the virtual vacation link again in the chat. Actually, hang on, my computer's acting up. There we go. And I also have put in the information too on how you can find us if you're local for the meetup groups as well as um, where you can find us online and how to contact us through our email and I'll copy and paste that back in. Christina, Joe, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback in the comments that people thought this was great and it was. And again, for those of you who were not able to purchase the kits ahead of time, we will send the link out for that in the follow-up on this. Um, we have, I apologize, I don't wanna, I apologize, my computer tonight is not, well. A perfect way to spend a Tuesday night tasting from around the world and seeing beautiful sights and the places we hope to all go very, very soon. <laughs> yes. Sooner versus later, right, Heidi? Exactly. Exactly. And there are still places, for those of you who are comfortable traveling now, there are places that are open to tourism. Please reach out to your advisors. We're happy to answer your questions on that, as well as help you book those locations. Um, our next virtual vacation is going to be on the 18th of March. We are going to South Africa. Um, if you have questions about that or haven't registered, we do have those um, links in Eventbrite as well as our meetup groups, or our, I'm sorry, our Facebook groups, Take a Virtual Vacation and Eat, Drink, Travel. Those links are again, just posted in the chat. And then um, we have, a way for you to save it. So if you're looking in the chat function, to, on the bottom right corner, you're gonna see three dots. If you hover over that, you're gonna see a little box that pops up and says more. Click on that, and then you'll see a box that pops up and says save chat. Click on the save chat, and that way you will have it um, in your, it'll open up in your notepad on your computer. Thank you again, Christina and Joe. We've had a fantastic evening. If you weren't hungry before and didn't eat, I am so sure you are now between the pictures that Christina <laughs> shared and the olive oil and vinegar tasting. Also, I wanna let everybody know if they didn't realize it, Joe sends four fabulous recipes with this kit and my daughter and her boyfriend are cooking two of them right now as we speak for our dinner after this. And I can't wait. <laughs> okay, that means you have to share after. Sure. I will. You've got to I will. I'll you. post pictures. <laughs> Please do. Please do. <laughs> Maria, I just wanted to add one more thing, if I may. Sure. Um, for, for everybody who's concerned about travel to Europe, uh, the touring boards are doing everything they can to get things open up as soon as possible. And um, both Italy and Greece are doing a lot of really, really lenient cancellation policies. So it literally is a win-win if you, if you book ahead. And there's, I mean, there's some where it's like 24 hour cancellation prior. Um, if you book flight insurance, uh, flexible flight policies, travel insurance, and a flexible hotel, you might as well plan your vacation because we really hope it'll open up soon. So keep in mind um, flexible terms. Um, they're really on your side right now as a travel consumer. Yeah, and right. the Thank fact you. that I'm hearing from more and more of our travel partners that the availability is low. So, you know, people have rebooked from last year. They're already booking for next year. So if you want to be able to either get that hotel or, um, 
you know, be able to get in on a particular experience because a lot of them right now you have to reserve in advance. You need to book early. Um, Debbie is asking about the link for the olive oil. We'll be sending that out in the follow-up. I don't have that in front of me. I apologize. Oh, I can throw it in there. I, I got it. Oh, okay, great. Great. Otherwise, if there are no more questions, we'll let um, Candace throw that in there. And even though I ate dinner earlier, I think I'm going to go get some bread and dip in my olive oil. <laughs> and balsamic, I'm, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, are they making vaccines mandatory for overseas travel? You know, a lot of that is still up in the air. Um, not everybody's been able to be vaccinated yet. So, Christina, what are you hearing about that? Well, it's really right. important you you break your trip down. So your mm -hmm. airline will have specific requirements. The country you're entering will have specific requirements. Um, so just kind of pay attention. And that's why it's more important now than ever to book with a travel advisor, because if you start DIY with all these regulations, I, I don't even, I'm scared. That's why Maria, I call you when I need help with my flights because I can't do it. So um, yeah, I would say always, you know, it's, we're pre-booking now for Greece and a lot of people aren't sure what Greece will look like. I'll speak to Greece specifically because I'm, you know, it's what I, I deal with daily. Um, the Minister of Tourism is saying that they will only require um, a negative test versus a vaccine specifically in Greece, but that doesn't mean your airline won't have other requirements. So that's why it's really important to look at your trip very holistically and make sure all the elements from start to finish are something you're comfortable with. And that's why I definitely um, use your I, advisor. I think people might be asking too, because I think it was Royal Caribbean that just came out today with um, they're, they're opening up their cruises now to vaccinated uh, Americans. So I think they're launching in June, I think is what the article had said. So that is probably why people are asking. Yeah, and keep well. in mind, mm -hmm. even if you book today, that doesn't mean that when you travel, those requirements are gonna be the same. Right. Those are, you know, and that's right. what we can really help you stay on top of. Yeah. Great. All right. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us. We've had a fantastic evening. Join us again on the 18th of March when we visit South Africa. And again, you can find our the links to those either in the Facebook groups or through Eventbrite, or reach out to one of us, and we'll be happy to send you the link. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.